So whenever, do I have the mic now? Do I just start? I can do a perfunctory introduction to the okay. few people who are here, and then you'll have to reintroduce yourself. So, folks, welcome. It's really nice to see you. We are in week four of our Wise Action class series, which has been phenomenal, and we expect no less tonight. No pressure, Niels. Uh, Niels is a, a wonderful teacher. We're very happy to have him. He likes chocolate. And he has a dog. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, today is the full moon. And in traditional um, Buddhist countries, that is the time where people take the precepts. And uh, when I practiced as a monastic, we would stay up all night. This was in Thailand. Um, when I went to England, we only stayed up until midnight. Um, but it was a time to fast um, and also to to kind of have a review of our conduct, and then we would have confession. So I grew up as a Catholic. Um, I don't have bad memories of being a Catholic. I know that some people have been hurt by that church. Uh, in El Salvador, it was liberation theology, and these Jesuits at my school would make us think. And um, so I have a very good um, feeling when I think of the mystic Catholic and the liberation theology tradition. And what I find interesting is that confession is pretty much lost in the kind of everyday Buddhist section. And, and in European-based cultures, shame is something that people deal with. And so sometimes having to review your conduct can lead you to shame, which is not the purpose. You know, the purpose is just to say, hey, how am I doing? Can I do a little bit better? So I wanted to start with the fact that uh, all over the Buddhist traditional world, people are reciting the precepts. And uh, I will incorporate them in part of the meditation today. So do precepts as a reflective, as a vipassana, like a real insight cultivation practice. And also before meditating, I, I have a practice of what I call the bridge. In many cultures, you will chant, you know, for 10 minutes, um, or you will do a little bit of yoga, or you will, you know, you, there's, you light a candle, you do some incense. There's this bridge between your everyday life, you know, like you've been running around, or you were filled with anxiety, or you were, you know, whatever it is that was in your day, you do something to bridge going into silence, so that you don't go from, ah, my day, to, okay, now watch your breath, shut up. Uh, you know, so it can be, it can be a, a difficult transition. So if you are physically able, and if you want to join us, we're going to do just a little bit of movement to, to bridge and just kind of take some, some breath. So we start with, uh, take one hand and put it on the opposite knee. And if it's comfortable, just do a little bit of a twist. If you have something else that would be better for you right now, and do that. Take one inhalation. Exhale back to center. Inhale, twist to the other side. So the other hand on the other knee. And just give a ring to your spine. Take a deep breath in. Out back to center. Now use only gravity to stretch your neck by putting your ear to your shoulder. And relax the shoulders and just feel that stretch on your neck. Again, if this is comfortable for you and if you're able, take a deep breath in. Out, back to center, in. Breathe out, other ear, and just feel that stretch. If you do this every day, you can graduate putting your hand on top of your head to give it a stronger stretch, but we're being super gentle right now. Breathe in and out back to center. Take your chin to your chest. 
breathe in, out back to center and take your chin to the sky. Breathe in, out back to center, we're almost done. Put your fingertips on your shoulders with your elbows. You're gonna go all the way front, all the way up as much as you can, all the way back as much as you can, and all the way down. Do that twice more, front, up, cheapest massage in town, front, up, back, and once you've done three, switch directions. Back, all the way up, way down. Okay. A little bit of gentle shoulder rolls. And my second grade teacher used to say, hagan estrellitas, which means make little stars. Let's make little stars. And finish with moving energy from your forehead very gently. You just do the sweeping and we have crossed the bridge. <laughs> if you enjoy that, keep doing it. It's a nice practice to just do a little bit, just a little bit of movement or chanting or bowing uh, to get you ready for a change, change of consciousness. Uh, a time when we're not asking the universe or our bodies for anything. You know, pure awareness, Nibbana, it just, it just means a fire that has gone down, you know? Enlightenment can be, this can be debatable, but you know, just for one moment, if you can feel two seconds of no greed, no hatred and no deletion, that is a blessing that we need to take in. So, in the past week, you've had the privilege to not be in a situation where you've had to kill someone. Take that into your heart. You know, there are people at war. There are people whose background has been so difficult that killing is easy for them. If you've had a life where you've never had to kill someone, that is a gift. And if you have, and it's forgiveness, what we need, you know? If you've had your needs met in this past week where you didn't have to steal anything, take that gift in. You didn't have to steal to survive. Or you have a moral compass where you were able not to steal. And that's a blessing. If your use of alcohol or any other substance, if you're able to take that in moderation, or your mind was not clouded, just for the past week, if you have suffered, suffered with addiction and now you don't, that is a blessing to remember. Speech is one of the hardest things to keep in check. If you didn't tell horrible lies, that's a blessing. Maybe you gossiped or you exaggerated and remember to want to do better. If your sexual energy and your sensual energy was in check, you didn't hurt yourself or others, however you define that for yourself, that is a blessing. There are 30 meditation objects in the scriptures, and one of them is the recollection of the goodness of our lives. And you know, you can sit for half an hour 
think about what a good person you are. And this can be really difficult also for European-based cultured people. To just sit without arrogance. You did something good, you know, you can sit and celebrate that. You know, tonight we had enough health, enough time, enough resources to be here in community. And that is something that is a big blessing. It's the full moon. You can attune to the energy of the planets. If you have a meditative practice or a meditation object, I invite you to start doing it now. And just sitting humbly, watching the mind. The hindrances can come, you can be sleepy, annoyed, out of sensual desire, whatever it comes, there's also an antidote. If you're feeling anger, then you invite gentleness. You invite love, which is metta. If you have low energy and you're feeling lethargic, virya energy and, and willpower. If it's been a really difficult day, and more it's gentleness. However we meet this moment, to meet it with gentleness, not wanting to achieve anything. And if you're breathing, you're alive. You can always honor the breath by watching its natural rhythm.
meditation can feel like it's hard work. How about just showing up in humility in this past, in this next few moments, as we finish our time of silence? Knowing that what we're feeling right now can be unpleasant, can be pleasant, it can be both, or it can be neither. And is that okay? Do you give permission to this body of ours to just be how it is? Can you be patient with your mind? Just take a rest from judging it or wanting something. And this full moon where our siblings who practice review their conscience and review their actions. If it feels right for you, take an inner pledge to continue to commit to not kill so that violence is not the driving force in your life. As much as possible, as time is coming, commit to not take what is not given to you, to ask for permission to, to not steal, yeah, to not steal. To reflect wisely in Pali, it's Yoni Somanasikara, so that what comes out of our mouth in words are said at the right time to the right person with the right intention. That we honor our bodies and everybody else's bodies and, our, and the sensuality and sexuality that we have as a gift. And that we ask for healing if we need healing with our sexual lives. And that we understand the context of moderation in our own lives when it comes to substances. So that whatever we put into our bodies and on our bodies 
is done consciously. These are aspirations that we can take as refuge when the world is going crazy. Those things, you can do your best to have some control when you can't have control of other things. You can put the effort to say, to do things that are filled with generosity, wisdom, and kindness however you understand those words. Let's take a three minute break to stretch or get some water, some bio break, and we'll be back in three minutes. So if you're back on the chat box, can you put one to 10? How stressful was your week overall? If you think of your body, your mind, your emotions, one is you were not stressed at all. 10, it was very, very stressful. Um, if you would like to share So far, the range is from one to eight. And, um, you know, so it, it, we're living in such whew, weird times. Uh, this week is the 86th birthday of one of my teachers, Ajahn Sumedho. He's been a monk longer than I've been alive. And, um, and then this weekend, I had my first relative die of COVID-19. He, uh, he's actually the husband of my aunt. They're both doctors and they... They both got it and she got very sick, but survived. And he was buried on Sunday, you know, um, a very small gathering and in El Salvador is very complicated. The, the health system collapsed about three weeks ago. So it's been, um, it's been very, very strange. Uh, when the call got out to talk about, you know, how do we meet this moment? At, at the sort of bigger level, you know, so you meet it like any other day, right? Dukkha and Dukkha is the same 
And uh, although that's true, you can also have that good old spiritual bypass where you can just say, oh, well, that's just the, the way it is. Humanity has always been foolish. Um, so I made a little outline of the description of what I was going to talk about. I was just in bed and I, I wrote the description of this. And uh, it's kind of like how my mind works. So I'm going to share those um, slides that I just made about half an hour before the meeting started. And, okay. So the word kindness is used a lot. And I was wondering the other day, I'm like, what is, what is the actual definition? Because you can get all cutesy, like, oh, kind. And, you know, there's, there's nice things like random acts of kindness. Like, you're just kind of nice, right? And same with the word wisdom, you know, very common word. But what does it mean for me? Like, what in that definition changes so to ask oneself once in a while what is my current working definition of the word kindness how does that show up in me how do i recognize it in other and the same thing with wisdom you know when i you know i started meditating when i was a teenager and my idea of wisdom is very different from the one that i have now you know I thought wise meant being really special and knowing a lot of stuff. And now it's more along the lines of seeing the way things are, you know, and uh, not, not resisting. Um, so my teacher, Ajahn Sumedho, constantly said this, explore the habitual patterns of, our, of your mind. And I got um, quite bored of hearing it. I was like, okay, yeah, whatever, 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 you know. And habitual patterns is where we go to the default when when we get stressed out, when we have dukkha, when we have dukkha, those things show up, right? Whether it's uh, trauma, another word that's being used a lot, karma, uh, word that's very misunderstood. All of those patterns can show up, and they're. I think he called them habitual because they repeat themselves. And, uh, and one word that I've become very curious about is the word humility. Um, it's, it's kind of meeting, meeting the moment um, with adding a lot. And also my tendency has been to be quite arrogant in the, in the sense that um, I believed, or sometimes I believe that my thoughts are the right thoughts or that the way things are done or whatever, you know, I, um, and it's quite uh, embarrassing to, once we find out that arrogance is a very weird form of insecurity. Uh, Kanti Bhavana, the cultivation of patience is one of the most difficult things a human being can cultivate you know it's um again i i'm a fan of pali this language because the context is very specific as opposed to english which is even less specific than spanish in my mind you know when, when you say oh i don't like crochet because I, i'm not i don't have the patience for it well if you love crocheting you don't require patience <laughs> Patience, with my definition, is that you're withstanding that which is difficult to withstand, which is the textbook definition of dukkha. Dukkha is that which is difficult to withstand, that, that which is difficult to be with. And that is called a truth of the noble ones, or, that, or a truth that is ennobling. Or, you know, it, 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 it's... Uh, Dukkha as suffering is also, as I just submitted to say, one of the most mundane things. Happens all the time to everybody. There's nothing special about it. Why is it a noble truth? And it's uh, because it can be the key yeah, to, to do it. And finally, 
something I've been working with the last two, three years is this zooming in and zooming out. So whatever the moment is, you know, when I was a kid, it was a civil war and there were bombs and fires and um, shootings, right, in El Salvador. And however, you know, whatever is happening in the world, the perspective of how is this body feeling? The definition of an emotion is that it is registered in the body. If it's not in the body, it's not an emotion. You know, you can think you're happy, you can think you're sad, you can think you're angry, whatever it is. But if it's an emotion, it is in the body. Yeah. You know, when people feel gratitude, many times they cry, like the body can't handle it and tears have to be released. When sometimes you're so happy, the body cries, like you can, oh my God, I'm so happy. And when the body's sad, it cries. It's a release. Those chemicals in the tears have to be released. We also have the compassion in the body. When something is so strong, the body faints. You will faint. You know, that's why torture, I put this t-shirt on and um, Amnesty International is close to my heart because you know, they, they work at uh, helping victims of torture and uh, something about torture is that it has to be gradual so that you don't faint. You know, it's, it's a cruelty that's really horrible. So anyway, those are some of the things that I wrote when I think about meeting the moment. And what I beat my focused interventions um, is not about doing more or saying, okay, now I'm going to have a list of what to do because there's, you know, COVID-19 and, and there's all these more focusing on racism and what am I going to do? I have to do something. I have to do something. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, humanity is going through something, you know, very difficult. And then the United States is also, you know, there's elections. And I, I lived in Minneapolis. I moved from San Salvador to St. Paul. And uh, Mark, the, the head teacher at Common Ground Meditation Center in Minneapolis, asked me to give a talk on, uh, I don't know, like, how do you practice in difficult moments, something like this. I said, okay. Five weeks later, you know, after I had agreed to do that, I had to give the talk on the Sunday right after George Floyd had been murdered. Now in Minneapolis, you know, seeing the news, like at the restaurant where I used to eat before this board meeting at a theater and the supermarket that was burning is where I used to get my injera bread, you know, cause there's a Somali community there. And I was, you know, I was in, a, in quite a state and I'm like, what am I gonna tell these people, you know, in Minneapolis, about how to practice in difficult moments. And I just went to the basics, you know, and, and all these words that we hear, you know, compassion, what does it actually mean? You know, here, like here, right here. What, what is that? When you open your heart enough that it, you know, it can break a thousand times and you're like, you know, what happens when, when the anger um, is what has to be felt. And, and, you know, in Buddhism, you can say, oh, anger is bad. You know, don't feel that, you know, like I was saying in the, in the meditation, there's an antidote. But the antidote is you honor the anger. And how can you catch yourself so that you can be reflective? So that you don't become like the enemy. Someone very close to me said uh, a couple of days ago, it'd be so great if Trump died, if someone killed him, if he got COVID. And uh, I'm not Mr. Spiritual Teacher every time, you know, but I'm like, oh, no, that's, that's not it, you know, but I, I, I didn't have to go into preaching mode. But to me, if the response to someone who's violent is then to have violent thoughts and violent actions, I don't think I'm helping myself. 
Like I'm, I'm super convinced and I don't think I'm helping others either. And so as we wake up, you know, for some people, this COVID has been actually a lovely time, you know, and do you have to feel guilty about it? No, you don't. You know, there are some people that are gardening, that are reflective, that don't have to commute, that actually in their experience, this has been a pleasant time. And that's just a reality. And then you say, okay, I have energy, then what, what is my role now in spiritual life? How do I meet the moment if what I have is privilege and what I have joy? You spread it around, right? And uh, oh, someone wants to say hi. This is my old little dog. She told you, little, little, little dog. She's asking to say hello. Um, she's deaf. <laughs> she has really bad arthritis. But there she is. She got rescued and now she's she's here. So yeah, meeting the moment, um, reaction versus responding. And, you know, it's so easy to go into cliches and I'm going to open it up for, you know, questions or please feel, please feel free to um, put anything uh, on chat if you want me to respond. Also, if you disagree with me or if I say anything that's inaccurate, disrespectful or whatever, I, I want to know. Uh, that this reaction is what in Buddhism is called a second noble truth. Paticca Samuppada is 12 links that show you when you have one of the six senses, your mind being one of them, when your eye meets an, an, uh, a visual object, and then you meet, or then you, you smell something, or you taste something, you can have a reaction. And so right now we're having a lot of mind stimuli, you know, that, that there's stuff in the news, there's stuff in the, you know, uncertainty, there's fear. And this chain reaction begins whenever you say, I don't want it to be like this with attachment, because it's okay not to want it to be like this. You know, if you're in a really stinky place, then you move to where it's not stinky. Like that's, that's responding. So Ajahn Chah, my teacher's teacher used to say, you know, if your purse has dog shit, the whole world is going to smell like dog shit. <laughs> you know? So you put the purse down or you take the stuff out. Like that's responding. Yeah. And so you look at your own life and you become reflective. And what is this reflection? You know, is using thoughts in, in a way that lead you to the end of suffering. And uh, I'm sorry to talk so much about Ajahn Sumedho, but he's on my mind because of his, you know, whenever he was his birthday, we got a special breakfast and we were monks. Uh, I was there from the time I was 23 to the time I was 30. I'm 50 now. It's been a while. But, you know, most of my 20s, I was wearing these ugly robes and eating one meal a day. And so when we got a special breakfast, it was like, yay. You know, but his, his constant saying was mindfulness is the death to the deathless, is the door to the deathless. And Amaravati, where I lived, Amara means deathless, it's the, death, the deathless realm. I have to be honest with you, I was there the seven years and mindfulness is the door to the deathless, would come in one year, it would go out the other one. It is a quote from the scriptures. And I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. <laughs> but as, as I practice, and uh, I'm also in touch with a Catholic group here of, of elders. You know, I'm, I'm one of the young ones at 50. Most people are in their 80s, yeah. some in the early 90s. When say love is, God is love, to me is the same as the Buddha knowing the Dhamma or mindfulness is the, the door to the deathless. Because again, these words in English, you know, God, it doesn't mean Santa Claus wearing Roman robes, you know, and love can be, you love your ice cream, you love your mother, you love your lover. But once you practice, the scriptures of a lot of traditions make a lot of sense. Like the Heart Sutra in Mahayana Buddhism, I read it and I'm like, yes, yes. Although it's saying no ear, no tongue, you know, there's this chant and I'm like, you're, you're speaking truth. 
and the world can be burning and you still have this body you know i mean i remember i used to have this practice i don't have it anymore but whenever i got stressed out or um, anxious i used to have this thing that i would say am i going to die in the next three minutes and i'll go no okay am i going to be really badly physically harmed in the next three minutes i'll be like no is anyone i love or anyone i know going to die no is anybody going to get hurt no and then once i did that then i would just deep because <sighs> i was quite afraid of windows for a number of years you know when the bombs would explode i had this image of glass being crusted in my back you know my house was destroyed by a bomb when i was 11. Um, but you know that was a practice i had i'm not gonna die i'm not gonna get hurt okay <laughs> And I still have anxiety that comes up. I've named it Chucho, so I can have conversations with it. And if it's mild, then it's Cuco. And now I've told this to my friends, and then I know, like, I know Linda. So I know these other anxieties. And we can have conversations with them. You know, I wake up and I don't know why it's there. But it's like, oh. Right now, Chucho, I need to suppress you because I need to go teach my high school students. Or, okay, why are you here? I don't know why you're here. You know, maybe I need to journal. Maybe I need, and that's reacting. And um, we don't have control of how we're going to wake up every morning. You know, if depression is the anxiety, is what is felt, it doesn't matter what's happening in the world. You know, it could be Mickey Mouse in Disneyland and you're in Disneyland and you're feeling depressed. And the world could be burning and you're still, you know, so it, it's, it's kind of responding. Um, so my practice is uh, to kind of, before I open it up, and I can talk for a long time, is again, um, as much as possible, try to understand what patience uh, means to you and also uh, give ourselves permission to um, feel gratitude you know and if we go into grieving you know if someone has died or there is nothing like grief you know, that pulls you down to the earth. And, and uh, in this culture, there's not a lot of rituals. You know, there are some rituals where you wear something and you chant something or you hit, you know, like doing this to your body actually is very good for your nervous system or um, having a whole community, right? Like we, in many ways, we are in a ritualless um, culture. So finding rituals for me has been very, you know, I have my little altar with Krishna and the Buddha and the Virgin Mary. And, uh, and when I lived in India as a student, college student, I was quite struck by the altars everywhere and the chants. And, uh, and also in monastic life, it doesn't, you know, it didn't matter whether I was feeling happy or anxious. You would wake up, you do the chanting, meditate, sweep. Like, like these rituals can be so anchoring. Um, it can be good, and uh, and also a sense of humor, you know. Sometimes I ask Alexa. My my husband has installed Alexa everywhere, so I can change his light to blue by talking to it, and and then I can ask. You know, sometimes I'm like, Alexa, how big is the Milky Way? And Alexa, how many galaxies in the universe? And you get you get these numbers, right? I was like, how many trillion trillions? And then here we are in this little planet. You know? It's like, and what's interesting is that the same consciousness that moves the galaxies is the consciousness that's in us. You know? And, uh, and if you really look at Buddhism and Hinduism, they don't say consciousness is in the body. 
the body is in consciousness. And this is a word, you know, and we can get really heady about it. But um, as you continue to practice, and maybe you can feel one second of silence, then you just have proof that the nature, the natural state of the mind is very uh, peaceful. And um, yeah, <laughs> and God is love, you know, it makes sense. <laughs> the Tao, you know, when you submit to Allah, you know, when you, when you, you give yourself and, and, uh, and when you get enlightened, they're all saying the same thing. I'm present, I'm here. And at this moment, there's no, there's no, you know, space for greed, hatred, or desire. It's very simple. Just make it incredibly complicated. Um, I want to know if you are uh, reacting or responding or having thoughts about what I've said. Any responses? And it's okay if you don't as well. Yeah. Hi. Jenny. Hi. Hi. I I really related in a different way, not because I have been my house was bombed when I was eleven. And I'm so sorry for that. Um I it just makes me want to cry. It but I keep saying to myself as I start to dive into the hole of anxiety and despair, it's like, well, there are no bombs dropping. That's what I've been saying to myself in this time. Well, there are no bombs dropping. Everything is just fine. <laughs> mm, mm. So uh, that really, I mean, of the million things that you said tonight, that struck me that was really just like whoa what what so, yeah thank yeah you. and and i want to share something with you i'm surprised that i actually share that with you because um once i figured out in college that americans have a tendency to glamorize their suffering um and what i mean by that is there's this narrative of i pulled myself by my bootstraps so i figured out that by me telling the story that my house was bombed it would make me very special and I, I would get an audience. So now I'm really careful about the stories I tell about myself. And although that was traumatic, I've done so many healing stuff about the war. And, you know, and sometimes it was like, it wasn't the war. It was the way my father treated me, right? Because being a gay kid in a machismo society was, you know, and being in Minnesota where, the white people accepted me as gay, but the brown people didn't accept me as gay. And then I found racism as a brown person, you know, intersectionality. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's tough, but, but there's something about glamorizing my suffering. And, and, and thank you for saying it. Sorry about that experience. It was, it was hard, but again, it no longer, it's become... It, this is an image that's really been useful to me, is that it's a scar. It's no longer a wound. So a scar can be ugly, but it can't get infected. It doesn't hurt. It cannot kill you. So really identify what's a wound and what's a scar. Because if you are in a situation where you're being wounded, you, 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 know, you really, really need to to try to heal, to try to escape that situation, right? To, and that's, uh, but, uh, but yeah. But I'm glad that I've had millions of things that I've said that resonate with you. <laughs> I'm so wise, let me get my hair. I tell my students that only nice people can look at my, can see my hair. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Um, yeah, 
of the millions of wise things you said. Um, one thing, this has kind of become a running joke with, with Katie and myself, but I think you said it so explicitly that I want to ask you about it. We named this class series Wise Action, and yet every teacher who has taught has said something about patience. And I think that's so interesting and there is something really profound there. And you kind of summed up the end. I really appreciate what you said at the end about patience and gratitude and sense of humor, but it, it's just really interesting. And I, I wonder if you yeah. could say more about that. Why, why is this serious? It's called wise action, but we keep talking about patience, which is not the opposite of action, but it's, it's oh oh it takes oh believe me it it takes a lot of energy and effort yeah. to you know and again if we can use kanti bhavana in in the context of of the buddhist scriptures bhavana is cultivation yeah even meditation is called bhavana and then you have vipassana and then you know you have samatha like there's these different branches mm -hmm. um ajahn cha there was used to be a picture of him at against the stream that that, that monk that, that was laughing by the drinking fountain that's ajahn cha yeah mm -hmm. i got to thailand on the second anniversary of his death and there were like hundreds and hundreds of monks circumambulating his uh, you know ashes and uh he was teaching young rice farmers and you know he would make life really difficult for them because in the northeast of Thailand, the the young men would be like, oh, sabai, sabai, you know, that kind of means like, oh, life is good. But with the Westerners, they came in with a, 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 a I don't like the word Westerner, by the way, but there you go. Because I'm like, west of what? <laughs> and like, Aborig you know, Aboriginal people are what? Westerner or Easterner? Native people are Westerner, you know, like it's kind of arrogant, like they're south and north and the moon, I'm like, why does it have to be west or east? Anyway. Um, so he constantly pushed the monks so that they would develop patience because honestly it's one of the biggest tools in your toolbox to deal with life if your definition of dukkha is that which is difficult to withstand what is withstand mm -hmm. you know like you have this fortitude and the word hope has never been important to me, but I'm beginning to understand also that it is a trust uh, that you can be with the present moment. That is not about the future, you see. And um, to me, patience and contentment are two of the highest spiritual qualities you can have. And think about American culture, it's the antithesis. You worship convenience, right? Like I remember when my husband worked for Target and they had analyzed how many seconds people can wait in the checkout line so that they would get call in someone else so that they would not feel any impatience, yeah? And then contentment is the most anti-capitalist thing. I'm okay with what I have. I, why would a capitalist want to teach you that? And so we've been breathing convenience and non-contentment. And as we have a planet that has been hit by this pandemic, all of a sudden it's like, oh, there were 10 things I could distract myself. You know, this is the first time in 30 years that I haven't traveled. <laughs> I was going to go to Spain. I was going to, go to, you know, I have four sisters in four countries. And my mom is still in Minnesota. So if I want to see the people I love and I, and I love to travel and I didn't know how much I liked art museums, right? So we're getting into this, this thing and monastic life does this where, where you have to be patient with being hungry. You have to be patient with sleeping on, you know, with that which is difficult. And life is difficult for many people, you know, like I, I, one of the compassionate practice that I'm doing is 
there are people right now who are unemployed and a loved one just died. Like thousands of people. And that's the reality, you know? And so that the meditation of at this moment, I'm in solidarity with you, right? Because compassion can be very difficult, actually. You know, for years I did a meditation with a, an imaginary child that was being hurt. And I just, I was like, because I knew that at any given moment, a child is being hurt. And I was like, I'm with you, you know? And sometimes I would, tears would stream, and I'm like, this is my compassionate meditation because it's a prayer, you know? I'm spending this time right now opening. And compassion um, makes you want to live a life that's not stupid, you know? Like, <laughs> makes you want to, you know? And I'm not, and I'm not judgmental, you know, I mean, I, yesterday I was having my snack, you know, I'm like, I think what I need right now is a little bit of shortcake. <laughs> I froze, I made some shortcake. I put a little bit of lavender, so delicious. And after that, I think what I need right now is a popsicle. <laughs> this is last night, right? I'm like, I'm watching TV and I just need a popsicle. I don't need a popsicle. Right? So it's not like you get this graduation of spirituality where you're not going to do silly things. You know, we're human beings. I have popsicles in the fridge. I'm going to eat a popsicle. And now I'm like, okay, that was a little too much, you know? So today I'm a little bit more reflective. I'm like, I think, you know, some of these simple things like your food have become so complicated in this culture, you know, where so many people have so many opinions about what you should eat and when you should eat it and what's good and what's not. And that shame that goes into our bodies. So, yeah, patience is a big one. Hi. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, I, can you talk a little bit more about, honor, you've mentioned honoring your anger and you know, catching yourself so you can be reflective and not reactive. Um, yeah. Can you kind of talk a little bit more about that? Sure, um, and I also want to acknowledge that there is a question about um, separating patience with a feeling of being stagnant. Um, both are very good questions. Um, there's not just one anger, right? There's different kinds of angers. And again, you know, I. Karma is this mysterious thing that the word just means uh, there's different kinds of karmas. We have the karma of a, of a human being and the karma of a human being is that it dies. There's the karma of a tree. So that word is in the English dictionary and many times it just means cause and effect. But it, it has different meanings, you know, like it, it's also the result of, of your karma from previous um incarnations so i can prove to you right now that there's past lives so that you can no longer debate it okay i know something about all of you in your past life when you were three months old you didn't have the body that you have now you didn't have the same emotions obviously you didn't have the same thoughts but someone took care of you when you were three months old. So then now you're here. Something might have happened to you when you were three years, 13, that can create anger responses. And that's part of karma. It's not nothing, it's not anything that you did. It's something that affected you. And you know, again, the word trauma can also come into play. So if you have an anger that, that is there, you know, I have students, um, urban, you know, low income, sometimes they're gang impacted. And the only tool in the box is to, is to punch or say things that are so hurtful. African-American girls have been getting into fights in the San Francisco Unified School District at rates that we haven't seen. 
Now think about that. Women who are oppressed and black people who are oppressed and now they're going at each other at this, you know, when the oppression doesn't go vertical, it goes horizontal. And that anger is so real, you know, it, it's, 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 it's so, so very real. But it, I would say it's coming from, from karmic situations where it's not just somebody looked at me funny and now I'm angry, you know, you're responding from, and that's why this image, this classic image of the salt in water has been so useful to me. Because whatever your childhood was, if that, if this fist is the salt, and when I'm 13, my glass of water is like this, that water is so salty. I will never be able to change that salt from my childhood, but I can make the vessel bigger and bigger of water. So if you put this fist of water in, of, of salt in a swimming pool, it's not going to be so strong. And if you have it in a lake, so if you're working from a lake, your ability to respond to anger is going to be at a lot easier. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other anger is immaturity where, you know, it comes from greed, hatred, or delusion. I want the shiny object, you know, oh, I didn't get that job. Like people can get really angry about they didn't get, I don't know, their ice cream flavor or, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've seen people get angry for very small things. And that is, a manifestation of uh, the opposite of wisdom. You know, oh, I'm gonna get so angry because blah, blah, blah. And so ignorance creates, you know, people that get angry with their bodies. You know, um, I was flipping through the channels and now there's this show about plastic surgery, you know, and, and, um, what happens when you get angry with old age? <laughs> you know, the alternative is death. <laughs> but you can also have, you know, yeah. So uh, I think you know, I've noticed also with my anger, a lot of things that make people angry make me sad like what I experience in my body when I see cruelty or when, um, you know, if, if people are very unkind to me, um, I notice that the sadness comes first, yeah, which is interesting. Um, and there's, there are things for like, for example, like indignation, righteous indignation, where I've met peace activists that are so unpeaceful. And, or thinking that in order to be a social justice hero, you have to be grumpy and angry. And in my view, my ancestors, you know, El Salvador was an exporter of slaves. They took slaves to Peru via Ecuador. So we, our native people were enslaved and then we had people taken out as slaves. And what does that do to a culture, you know? And uh, so when I reflect, you know, on, on things like that, like there's a part of me that makes me like, I want justice. But I also think about these ancestors. They want their child to grow up and be happy, you know? I'm not a parent, I'm a step parent. But when I know parents, they want their kid to be happy. So when I work towards my happiness, I'm honoring my ancestors. Do you see that? They wanted me to live. And they wanted me to be happy. So in these COVID times, you know, so I've been doing like this Zumba Bollywood workout. And how can you take yourself seriously if you're like, yay? You know, like, <laughs> you know that's something that I've been doing. That's responding to it. You know, I have the time to do it. and. And uh, we've got to dance sometimes. We have 10 minutes. I want to respond. Um, 
to stagnation and there are dangers to patients. Uh, so I'm so glad that that was asked. Uh, people in the 1960s in San Francisco at the Zen Center ruined their knees because they were sitting, you know, session, very male kind of energy. I'm going to be patient. And then they had to have knee operation. That's not wise patience, you know. The other one is like, okay, I'm just going to be patient. <laughs> Uh oh, uh oh, I'm, I'm not really procrastinating. I'm just being, no, you know, like it, patience has a wisdom factor. And um, I'm so glad that this question got asked, you know, because men uh, don't go to the doctor. They're like, oh, I have to withstand. Like, no, go to the doctor, you know? comes with, uh, oh, I don't want to see a psychologist. Like my dad really needs a psychologist, but no, I'm so much easter, you know. And um, stagnating can be, a, 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 um, there's no energy, there's no wisdom, there's no joy, and, um, and there's no strength, you know, when, when you know, um, like when you name it, like I'm being patient, it doesn't make the moment any better at the, you know, when I first started working at the school that I'm at, I was teaching Spanish, which I'm not qualified to do, but they needed someone with kids who didn't want to be there. And they were making my life really difficult. So I would wake up and one day I was throwing up when I was walking the dog. I had so much anxiety about going to facing these teenagers who hated me. Right? And I'm like, I need to be patient. I need to be patient. The anxiety didn't go away because you can make this trick with yourself. Or, oh, if I practice, if I'm mindful, it's going to go away, but it doesn't. But, you know, eventually I just sat in a circle and I just really humanized myself. And I said, listen, you're going to pass this quarter. I mean, this grading period, but let's make a deal. I'm going to try my best. You know, we had a conversation and, and when I look back, um, there was this, this uh, quality of faith, of, of sadha in Pali, of, of having a, a confidence that, uh, that this too shall pass. So, ah, it's a lot. Um, and I hope what I've said, it's been, uh, it's been useful. Uh, it's, do you have any announcements, Noam, at the end of sessions? Or um, you know, often at the end of class, I feel so uh, uneloquent, <laughs> and I'm feeling that way now. You've said so many wonderful things, but that's not what you asked me. You asked if I have any announcements. <laughs> um, um, but I, but I, I really, the only announcement I have is that next week we'll have Mimi Monsier with us, and uh, it should be fantastic. And um, and you know, check our website for other things. And and uh, and I'm just so grateful for your teaching tonight. Feels so. If you have Indeed. more to say, I'd like to give you the last seven minutes. And there are some there are some notes in the yeah. chat. I don't know if you saw from Walt. There's a note. Uh, let me check. Uh, some upcoming events. <sighs> And yeah, oh, one other thing, if, if anyone isn't on our mailing list, because I know people are coming a little bit from outside, you can sign up for it. Uh, uh, Katie put the, uh, no, she didn't. She's going to put the link in the, in the chat. But you can go to our website and sign up for it there, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, anytime, yeah, talking about oppression, privilege, righteous indignation, um, and this is where all of it, you know, it requires this Yoniso Manasikara, this wise reflection, uh, because one of the warnings is that you can do stuff and think that that's going to be it, you know, um, like if you light the candles or if you go to the, the social justice meeting. 
um, in Oakland, where I worked the first four years after moving from Minnesota, I worked with these people of color that were kind of having this almost like a fight about who was more woke and who was more into it and who was more mm, like, you know, like, yay, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you know, in Minnesota, just having a faculty that would be all people of color would be such a blessing and whatever. And some of these people were, you know, couldn't see that what they were doing is enough and that people do things in different ways, that people contribute in different ways. So all of these teachers of color, not earning a lot of money, you know, I, or I earn more in San Francisco than I did in Oakland. You know, this was in Fruitville. The social studies room is on the second floor, four feet from what happened at Fruitville Station with Oscar Grant. You know, it's like real stuff. And, and it would sadden me and, and you know, I, I, I would tell them, it's like, there's bigger fights, you know. Um, and we can do that with ourselves, that we're not doing enough. And at the same time, how do you get the wisdom to say, hey, I, I need to wake up and look at my own privilege as well. And uh, it's, uh, it's edifying yeah, to, and that's why in the full moon, when you look at how you've acted and you're like, hey, I'm gonna try to do a little bit better. You know, and it's hard, like speech and my thoughts. I'm, I'm on the board of this nun, nunnery, you know, monastery for women. And the way they run their board meetings kind of drives me crazy because they just talk a lot. And I'm the type of person, you know, in the leadership circles, people can be analyzed. I'm like, okay, what's the issue? Let's get it done, move on. So I'm like, okay, I just have to breathe. And try not to say something stupid. But so it just keeps going, you know. And to understand that this Nibbana, that this Niroda is the cessation, is the third noble truth, that can be experienced in little moments, you know. It's not an achievement. No one ever is going to give you an enlightenment diploma. <laughs> it's just it's not gonna happen. And all the gurus and the most famous people and the people that have books that have been translated into 47 languages, they're just as human. And we don't know their karma. And we just keep going, you know. So you meet the moment. Keep going. Um, I'm glad I had the chance to practice with you. And um, hmm. If there's anything that I have said that's inaccurate or harmful, I ask for your forgiveness. And uh, if there's something that struck you and encouraged you, multiply that, keep going and, and find the joy within your heart. And ah, may this time that we have spent together practicing, may this time benefit all sentient beings. Mm. Have a good rest of your evening and night, and uh, hope your journeys continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nils. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you. Uh,